Hi, Sam. This is really great to have uh, had this discussion with you. But before before we begin, let me introduce you to my subscribers just in case they haven't heard about you, which I think is hard hard to believe because you're almost everywhere when it comes to the topic of narcissism. But um, Sam Vaknin, um, Dr. Sam, Dr. Sam Vaknin um, has a varied and deep um, career in many, many um, related and unrelated psychological endeavors. But what he's, what he's no, known most for is his groundbreaking uh, work on narcissism. He's written two best-selling books, and he'll tell you a little bit about them. But um, I have, but I am so pleased um, to be in this discussion with him. And before we begin it, let me turn it over to Sam and uh, and let's hear what he has to say um, about um, this discussion. Rose, thank you for for having me. Uh, it's been long overdue for us to to talk about these subjects. Uh, you're as ubiquitous as I am, so um, <laughs> I guess my subscribers. Have heard of you? I, it's not a guess, actually. I know your, my subscribers have heard of you, but still, to recap, you're a seasoned and, and long-standing um, therapist uh, with uh, great experience in the fields of addiction and codependence, which might be the same thing, actually. You know, coming to think of it, and you have made uh, contributions, which I've been following for a few years now. You've made contributions to. Uh, creating and generating a model of codependence which is both descriptive and prescriptive. In other words, it yields prescriptions for treatment and for self-healing and so on and so forth. So you've made a contribution to codependence that is uh, quite sizable and that in conjunction with your understanding of narcissism, I think could lead to some breakthroughs in understanding the connection between narcissism addiction and codependence, and there are subtle connections, and uh, in treating the victims of narcissists, or shall we say the survivors of narcissistic abuse. Well, that's, <laughs> thank you, Sam, that's very generous. And, and, well, that's, ac that's accurate. But I do appreciate it any, anyways. Um, for, for, um, for our um, listeners and viewers, um, it was interesting, before we uh, uh, put the record button on, Sam and I were discussing um, discussing um, how this video would go and one of the things that I said to him that I'd, I'd like to share with you is um, an aspect about his work and he as a person that uh, I admire greatly um, in fact um, he's the only person that I know of who is a uh, bona fide uh, legitimate uh, uh, sufferer from a, a personality disorder namely narcissistic personality disorder that actually has consciousness um, about it and the ability to control aspects of the disorder in order to interact uh, um, um, well, um, effectively, and, and, uh, uh, and pro-socially with other people. My experience with those with narcissistic personality disorder is they can't get past themselves. And I'm curious, uh, Sam, if you don't mind, how did you how did you do that? How did you um, manage to um, um, come up with an inner sense of control over the unique and predictable symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder? I simply, you know, in, in the early stages of psychoanalysis, in the beginning of the twentieth century, they came up with something called the conversion symptom. Oh yeah, conversion disorder. Um, that was Freud's, to do with, Freud's work. That was Freud's work, right? Yeah, that was Freud's work. And the idea was that there were somatic or bodily manifestations of mental problems. Mm -hmm. So similarly, I kind of converted my, my neediness, neediness for narcissistic supply, my addiction to narcissistic supply, I converted it into socially acceptable channels. I, see, I still seek narcissistic supply, and it's still a compulsion. Sure. It is still not under my, it's, I still don't control this need for attention, adulation, admiration, and failing that for being feared and hated. I still have all this, but I channel it in socially acceptable ways, and I leverage these needs, this energy, this pent-up enormous energy. I leverage it to help victims of abuse, survivors of abuse, 
to describe the narcissistic disorder to, in great detail, to expose the hidden nooks and crannies of what it means to be a narcissist, and to perhaps allow, provide a closure by proxy sure. to victims when they interact with me. In, in, in a way, Sam, we um, have a lot of similarities about you know, how we've managed our own psychological challenges. Is I was once very codependent, and it wasn't until I um, got I got myself in codependency recovery, worked through all the underlying issues that created the codependency, which I talk about. I might talk about later in this video, but I certainly talk about um, in my uh, in my other videos. I was able to triumph over the trauma and the addictive elements um, of um, the trauma that was responsible for my codependency. But what I noticed then, according to my continuum of self, is that I moved from this uh, deeply, um, this deeply affected, um, struggling person that always needed to help others in order to get validation. The healthier that I became, the more balanced I became, the more I was connected to my own needs. The more healthy that I became, the more I've been focusing on my needs doing things for myself. And I've noticed that I've developed what I, I consider my shadow side is a narcissistic predilection that goes in counter to codependency. So as much as I've worked on, and this is my connection with you, Sam, as much as I worked on my codependency, I now am working on my overcompensation of being too self-centered, entitled, or whatever would would would, uh, would be considered mild, uh, mild and some somewhat moderate moderate narcissism. It seems that both you and I were able to understand that our disorders um, were impediments in our lives, and we were able to do the psychological personal work in order to get a handle on it. it, it would that be fair uh, a fair summary of what you've said? Uh, yes, I, I have three three columns. Uh, about twenty years ago, I proposed that children react to abusive or dysfunctional home environments, sure, either by by becoming either narcissists or codependents. Right. I, someone, someone, <laughs> someone don't become anything. Someone simply go on through life of being totally normal and so, on. but. The more vulnerable, the more fragile, the more amenable, perhaps genetically, um, become either codependents or narcissists. So, in my view, codependence and narcissism are linked at the womb. They are twin reactions to this, the very same environment: dysfunctional, abusive, objectifying, dehumanizing environment. That's point number one. Point number two: I have noticed in my decades of interacting with victims and survivors, I've no, I noticed that in most post-traumatic situations and conditions, in the wake of abuse, as people recover, seek closure, um, reevaluate and reframe their lives and so on and so forth, I noticed that there is an emergence of what I would call narcissistic defenses. But these defenses, this propensity to put more emphasis on yourself, on your needs, on your well-being, sometimes at the expense of others, these defenses very rarely, if ever, coalesce into a full-fledged narcissistic personality, narcissistic style, let alone narcissistic disorder. These narcissistic defenses come to the fore as healing progresses, healing from abuse progresses, and then they are transient and then they, they vanish. And uh, so I, I think, to, to summarize, I think that narcissistic personality disorder, narcissists, are actually codependents. In my view, and it has been my view for a long time now, narcissists have a very, narcissism is a variant of what you might call dependent personality disorder. Nar narcissists depend on other people. They depend on other people for narcissistic supply. They regulate their sense of self-worth. They regulate their inner landscape. They regulate their precarious balance of their extremely fragile personality by resorting to feedback from the outside, by, by interacting with other people. 
And in the absence of this feedback, in the absence of this supply, and in the absence of these people, they fall apart. They crumble. Right. And so they are, narcissists are codependent. I could not be more um, in favor and, and more support that codependency and narcissism is born out of childhood trauma. In fact, the very first time that I figured this out, was about 20 years ago um, when I read Alice Miller's book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, um, during, right. during which in my own therapy, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what was up with my choices with all of these dysfunctional and unhealthy women. It, in, in a sense, it was the beginning of my human magnet syndrome theory. And what I learned um, from Alice Miller and my own therapy uh, was that um, our adaptation to a traumatic environment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, um, the relationship um, a child has with a narcissistic parent, attachment trauma, that is ground zero for the, um, the eventual emergence of either codependency uh, or pathological narcissism. So um, we, we, seem, we both agree on the idea that um, these, these, these disorders, uh, mainly narcissistic personality disorder or what I call pathological narcissism, um, is a result from the child, um, the child's natural needs um, to be loved just for who he or she is. When a child's um, um, environment um, is devoid of love, safety, um, they experience trauma. So if we think of that child having a narcissistic parent and the narcissistic parent only able to love someone, a child that makes them feel good, the child has two trajectories. Is the child capable um, because of her innate or um, ability to figure out how to meet the narcissistic needs of the parent? And Alice Miller talks about this. If the child can somehow adapt to the narcissist and figure out a way to be that trophy child, that gift child, that human doing, that uh, that child learns that he or she will get conditional love and that child will grow up with a form of attachment trauma where they um, only um, where they learn that if they can control their environment they will get love and attention now the other trajectory um, the other side of attachment trauma is if the child for um, all sorts of reasons, whether it's personality reasons, environmental reasons, or the parent's narcissism reasons, that child is unable to figure out um, um, to meet those narcissistic needs. That child is cast away. That child is then seen uh, and treated as a, as a narcissistic, an ongoing narcissistic injury. That child's experience early on is that the world is not safe, that there is no way that he or she will get um, the um, love that um, all humans need and that is the trajectory for the pathological narciss narcissism disorders well yes that's a that's a classical way of uh, of um, a classical way of uh, regarding the developmental trajectory of uh, codependence and, and uh, narcissism sure it's very psychodynamic and and, yeah. and most of my work um, come from whether it's conscious or unconscious some of the great scholars um, 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 out there um, who have taught me. So yes, I'm glad that you said that, that I didn't invent this, that this comes from um, the great um, masters of psych psychological theory and, attach Absolutely, yes. and attachment it's theory. Based, it's based on, on very solid foundations. These issues have been researched for decades. All, all these things are not something we have just invented, both of us invented on the fly. It's, uh, it's you know, well, well grounded. These are well-grounded observations with with very precise clinical application. While I think both of us innovate in many ways, it's all we know we are standing on the on the shoulders of giants. And that's important to emphasize because there is a body of literature and masses and masses of research and studies into both these disorders, codependency and narcissism. And it's it's important to know that. What we are saying has the weight, not only of our own personal experiences and our own interaction with victims and so on and so forth, but also these dozens of scholars who have dedicated their life, life and have come up with observations and studies and analysis and research. But um, there's a lot of people out there that are writing about narcissism. In fact, the term narcissism is almost becoming um, like codependence. The term codependency became 
in the 1980s. Everyone wants to talk about it. Everyone wants to give their own spin. But 75% uh, of what I read about narcissism are from non-clinical people who um, are just offering up their own opinion without a lot, lot of citations or background, um, um, clinical or psychological background. And what I hear you say, and which I really appreciate, is that what we both do is we try to teach others through our own, um, um, our own battles with our respective disorders. Mine um, um, is a recovering codependent. Um, um, and yours um, with someone who is narcissistic personality disorder is we, we wrote a book from our own experience and um, made it uh, and, and anchored it in clinical psychological research and data. Precisely. And I'll give you, with your permission, I'll give one example sure. of, of uh, recent developments which, you know, consider actually, with your permission, two examples. Wait, wait, wait. First, first Sam, no permission. <laughs> Okay. Don't, no, don't, 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 remember, I'm a recovering codependent. You're going to make me feel guilty. <laughs> right. well, that's a general idea. I'm an officer. That's great. Okay. We, so, we are settling back into our old country. Absolutely. Okay. You have my, from, from here on, you have my permission about everything. And remember, right. I can, and I'm remember. Avoid this very European way of talking. But remember, I can edit this. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay, go I'm ahead. Yeah, there, so I told you. So, yeah, so go ahead, Sam. Okay. So, for instance, um, about a month ago, a study had been published about, uh, it's, it was uh, fMRI, functional, functional imaging of, of various uh, brain areas. Um, blood flow into the various areas indicates which, which parts of a brain become active under certain stimuli, uh, certain circumstances, and certain situations. So the study discovered that all types, all subtypes of narcissists, uh, covert narcissists, classic narcissists, what I call somatic and cerebral narcissists. I mean, there were a few hundred narcissists studied. Right. The study, the study uncovered a very interesting phenomenon. They were all very needy. They all reacted with neediness. Now, I have suggested that long ago. I, I suggested that all narcissists, regardless of classification are in need of narcissistic supply and therefore they are needy by definition. Okay, so the study has been published and so on. So what's the implications? Why is it an, a very important study, a very crucial study? Because there's been an ongoing raging debate over the last 40 years whether narcissists are actually very self-confident, self-assured people who are just externalizing their innate feel of grandiosity or whether actually most, if not all, narcissists are very fragile. They, are, they feel inferior, and they are trying to compensate for this inferiority by pretending to be what they are not, uh, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, brilliant, and perfect. So there's been this debate. And Milan, for instance, Theodore Milan, one of the great, great grandfathers of the field of personality disorders, so Theodore Milan, insisted that all narcissists are compensatory. In other words, deep inside there is this knowing feeling of lack, inadequacy, uh, loneliness, fear of, of life and the hostility of the world, etc., etc., and that the narcissist is just compensating for it by pretending to be Superman. Right. And now this neurological study supports Millen's contention. And all narcissists are actually compensatory. I would like to give one last example to round up this segment. Sure. Um, a while back, about six years ago, that's more, I suggested that narcissists are actually possessed of empathy. They do have empathy. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was in stark contrast to one of, a criteria, one of the criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the Bible of the profession. Mm -hmm. One of the criteria with, with for diagnosing narcissistic personality disorder has been a lack of empathy, a complete lack of empathy, like there's no empathy. And I, I suggested that it may not be true. I said that empathy has several components. There is an instinctual component, there is a, an emotional component, a cognitive component, etc., etc. And I suggested that narcissists have a truncated version of empathy, which I called cold empathy, called the opposite of hot or warm. And there it, there it remained. To my utter delight, 
the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, not because of me, it's nothing to do with me, of course, but <laughs> still, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual edition, the, the fifth edition, which was published in June 2013. The DSM-5. The DSM-5, yeah. Yes. It uh, was published less than two years ago, uh, two years ago, actually. So they, and I, and I quote it, I quote from it, the narcissist finds it difficult to identify with emotions and needs of others, but, listen well, is very attuned to their reactions when they are relevant to himself. Exactly. And that is essentially all them, but you can't do that without empathy. If you are devoid of empathy completely means you don't resonate with other people. You know what you don't know what it means. You don't know the first thing about what it means to be human. That we cannot define narcissistic personality disorder as someone lacking empathy because the only personality disorder that I think that actually um, 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 has that as a diagnostic criterion is the antisocial personality disorder or the, or the psychopath. Exactly. See, exactly. And, and and so what I've noticed is that the, um, the that a narcissist and a codependent, the human magnet syndrome, they can't fall in love if there is no connection, no need to want to love one another. Because narcissists are capable of being in relationships, they want to love people and they want to be loved, there has to be an element of empathy. And, and I use your term, cold empathy. And in fact, I like that. Um, so it's empathy that is real, but it's self-serving. When there is a narcissistic injury or the narcissist need to fulfill um, his narcissistic needs are challenged, um, that empathy um, is um, put on hold and it becomes uh, a, a complete, it's all about me um, moment. And that, so, so I'm wondering if you, what your thoughts about, since we agree, and I'm glad, I'm really gl glad that uh, you said this because I've always been saying that narcissists love people, they're able to participate in relationships as long as their needs are met. But so, do you believe that um, with, within a narcissistic injury, empathy is absent? Yes, I believe that narcissists have the unique capacity to suspend empathy, to sort of turn it off and on, while with uh, normal people, whatever that means, by the way, the question <laughs> of normalcy, what, what is normal? <laughs> people that have problems that manage them, that's my definition. Yeah, well, it's uh, as good as any, and actually yeah. an excellent definition. But Okay, so people who are, who, do not, who are not narcissists, let's put it this way. People who are not narcissists, empathy is kind of a background noise. It's, um, it's something that they can't turn on and off. It's, it's utterly, probably unconscious. It, it, provokes them, it provokes emotional correlates and emotional reactions which, uh, which are automatic, uh, other directed, directed at, at, at the outside at other people and which allow them to put themselves in other people's shoes and to reach a modicum of understanding as to what may be happening in other people's minds. We call this in philosophy, I'm, I'm a philosopher by training, mm -hmm. we call this in philosophy the intersubjectivity agreement. Mm -hmm. So there is an intersubjective agreement, agreement between two minds or two brains. Mind you, no one has access to someone else's mind. That's, that's, that would be ludicrous even to suggest it. But we can reach a kind of agreement as to what may be happening, and that's empathy. Now, with narcissists, they are able to turn it on and off, exactly as you said. They, they are able to suspend it. The only point where I may differ uh, with you, and it's good to differ from time to time, it keeps the conversation alive and the juice is flowing. Plus, you, you would disappoint me if we didn't disagree. <laughs> This is, what fun would that be? But, but yeah, what fun would that be? You might as well shoot the, the video by yourself. Exactly. So the, only, the only point I think where we disagree, and perhaps there I have a bit of an advantage over you because I'm a narcissist. So I can describe, <laughs> no, really, I can describe I'm, la I'm laughing because I've never met someone who was so fluent and comfortable explaining that they're a narcissist. It actually goes against every experience I have with narcissists. So I promise I won't laugh again. But go ahead. Thank you. Uh, at least I think I'll take it as a compliment. I, it is. I really mean it as one. Please continue. No, no, I'm joking. Of course. So what I'm saying is I have, I have access to my inner landscape, to my inner world, which is denied to people who are not full-fledged narcissists normally. So one of the ideas I had um, when I heard you talk is you say um, narcissists can choose to be empathetic or not. I would challenge that. 
I think that evolved narcissists such as yourself can, and you are the exception to the rule. I think most narcissists are victims of their own narcissism and are not conscious of when, it, when their, um, their intimacy, their connection, their love, and their empathy um, gets short-circuited. So uh, I, I suggest that there is a smaller population of evolved narcissists such as yourself than actually have the capability of turning it on and off. The other thought I had as you were talking, I was thinking about evolution. Um, and I was thinking about that, you know, we evolved in order, you know, to propagate our species and, you know, to populate the world, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is, there is a, an evolutionary purpose of anger. Anger, um, anger um, um, creates uh, physiological reactions um, within our body that, re, um, that create neurological reactions that prepare us to protect ourselves. And I'm not, I'm not an anthropologist, nor am, uh, I, can I speak um, in any great certainty of my, my theory, but I believe that it is human to get angry, and, and when, it, when we are angry, our thought processes are constricted, and we become more self-centered. So I'm suggesting that the very action, the very instinctual action of being angry, creates um, a narcissistic-like process. Now, if you can accept that, now let's talk about someone who has a narcissistic injury and who, who has NPD. So then that anger is manifestly um, worse. It, it's say it's tripled, it's quadrupled. Um, I believe that it's very difficult um, as a, and I quote, um, in a, um, a normal person to be empathetic when they're angry. But I think it's virtually impossible and I, and I haven't seen it for uh, someone with NPD to have any empathy when they're angry. So I think that we, we share a very similar conclusion about it, but are explaining it from different point of views. What's your, what are your thoughts about my explanation? As to point number one, absolutely. The vast majority of narcissists are not self-aware, and they are not in control of their, of their psychological processes. So... When I said suspend or turn on, on and off, I may have given the, the wrong impression. Okay. I did not use the passive voice, but I should have. These are automatic under the surface. Actually, I did say that maybe it's unconscious. So sure. these are automatic under the surface processes. I fully agree. Yes. I'm a self-aware narcissist. And I don't know many who are. Putting, putting my intelligence aside, but I'm a self-aware of narcissists, so that gives me a lot of leverage, a lot of power over my mental processes and some a modicum of control, but that's rare, very. The, the, as to the second point, I've actually written a very involved and long article about, uh, about anger, which makes the, the very same point, that anger involves the suspension of empathy. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I postulate that narcissism, narcissism is actually a permanent condition of rage. I, I postulate that the, the mm -hmm. child who later becomes a narcissistic adult is full to the brim with unfulfilled, unrequited, diffuse, all-consuming, all-pervasive rage. Right. That this is the, uh, the condition of narcissism. And that this rage manifests in a variety of, of ways. Anger also, exactly as you pointed out, makes us self-centered. Right. Anger, anger leads to narcissism, exactly as you said. And when anger is permanent, narcissism is permanent. So the only point where we, where we disagree, luckily, because it's the first point in this whole conversation, and, you know, so the only point where we disagree um, is about uh, love, whether the narcissist is capable of love or loving. But I, I, didn't, and, I didn't say they can't, so... Um, be careful. So go ahead. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I, I actually believe, and and I and I've written about this. I know that they can love because a human magnet syndrome would not work. I know because I fell in love with many narcissists, and they weren't faking. They weren't sociopaths. It's love based upon the projective fantasy that they're going to get their needs met that they never did, and it's got to be all about them. The only advantage I have here is that I have access to my inner landscape, to my sure. inner 
mental processes as a narcissist. So that gives me a bit of a, um, an advantage, at least in articulation. Absolutely. So, so it is it is true that narcissists experience what they would label love. That means if you ask a narcissist straightforward, do you, you know, are you in love? Do you love? Many narcissists would answer, yes, I love my wife, I, you know, I'm in love with my girlfriend, and, and so on. So they use the label love. They mean it as well. I know. They imbue. Sorry? No, I said yes, absolutely. They imbue it, they imbue it, they imbue this word with the emotional content, with an emotional content that they believe is love. However, having subjected myself, and by the way, hundreds of other narcissists over, over 20 years, having subjected myself and others, into very rigorous analysis, <laughs> I can say that what narcissists call love has very little to do with what normal people, if you wish, non-narcissists would call love, with the functional, mature um, emotion that we call love. What narcissists call love is a combination of secure a secure source of narcissistic supply, right. the safety of the source, attachment to the source, deep attachment, dependence even, as Absol I said at the beginning. Absolutely. So this dependence plus attachment plus safety of narcissistic supply plus stability plus 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 other emotion other emotional needs which are satisfied put together as a package deal, narcissists call love. And um, very much as codependents call love emotions which are not necessarily love, as you well know, but much better than me. But, but, but let, me, let me jump in. Um, um, what you're saying resonates for me because um, in my continuum of self theory, I talk about the, the state of equilibrium where the, the, the codependent and the narcissist are balanced, and in that relationship, they experience love, albeit dysfunctional. And I warn my codependents, and I call it my Surgeon General warning, there's a YouTube, YouTube video on it, that if you get healthier, um, um, the narcissist will panic and will do anything that um, he or she can do to get you back in your codependent, um, codependent uh, you're back to your codependency. But what, very true. What, very what, true. And because the narcissist experiences it as abandonment and the potential loss of, as you expressed, and I agree, love. So what I've noticed, and it predictably, that when my codependents finally get to the point of, um, um, of, of solid recovery, the relationship often falls apart because um, um, many, if not most, people with narcissistic personality disorder, or for that matter, the other pathological narcissists, are unable to get healthier because they don't know they have a problem, therefore there's nothing to work on. Um, so what I've seen is at the point of divorce or the point of termination of the relationship is the narcissist goes into a state of panic and they say to the codependent, I love you, I love you so much, I'll change. These people are not sociopaths, they're not psychopaths, they're not lying. In that moment of panic, in their loss of the codependent, they are experiencing losing someone they love. Now they're not able to recognize it's narcissistic, it's a narcissistic point of view, but that panic that says, I will do anything, I will change, I believe that over 85% of the narcissists that promise I will change really mean it um, because they love that person because that has always been their experience with love. But sadly, Unfortunately, because of the disorder, they can't ever follow through with their promises because of the limitations of narcissistic personality disorder. So uh, it seems like um, we're saying the same thing, but we're using our, our own um, our own research, scientific, and uh, our own uh, our own point of view. Yes, yes, I I couldn't have said it better. I fully agree, and it's a brilliant point that narcissists coerce the partner back into a state of codependence. Because only when the partner is in a state of codependence, the narcissist feels safe enough okay. to feel, to think or to believe that he loves, to, to, to identify it as a state of love. So, so what, what, we're, what we're understanding is there is a, um, a human nature, uh, a very human aspect of love 
that the narcissists have. And when their narcissistic needs are met, they love the person according to um, their understanding, their worldview of what love is. Um, and my, that, wife keep, my wife keeps asking me, do you love me? I tell her, I love you the only way I know how, you know? Right. That's me. That's my love. Right. It's, uh, it may not be your love or someone else's love or the general definition of love, but to the best of my ability, that's my love, and I do love you. And according to my theory, without knowing anything about you personally, uh, is that your wife loves you because her relationship template, which was formed in her own childhood, um, was formed. Uh, her the relationship template that what is a result of her own experiences with her own parents um, um, set her on a trajectory to feel comfortable and feel loved and loving for narcissists. As I to share, to share one hundred percent, that's absolutely and one hundred percent correct. And and I would say and and by the way, every this is not her, you, me, or but and you and your relationship template uh, was formed because of your own experience of trauma uh, um, that you fit naturally, almost like, you know, and I talk about this repeatedly, like two dancers, the leader and the follower. Hey, Sam, um, let's kind of wrap this uh, this discussion up because I expect we're going to have many more uh, lively um, um, discussions and debates in the future. But um, let's both take some time to kind of like summarize um, our experience with this interview um, and, uh, and then kind of... Um, a bid our viewers a goodbye. My summary would be that codependency and narcissism are flip sides of the same, the same very sad and tragic coin. And that your work, I think, can put things right by allowing the narcissist to recognize the codependent in him and allowing the codependent to realize the unhealthy or the narcissistic elements in in the relationship. So that's how I see it. I don't know if I interpreted you correctly, but uh, after having read your book and watched some of your videos, sure. that's, that's, that I think that's a major contribution. Um, it's funny. Originally, I disagreed with that, and maybe that was my own defensiveness, um, mm -hmm. and I'm working on that. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, if I look at codependency as I have been, is, is not a disorder um, in itself, but a symptom of attachment trauma. Um, and, um, and we both have spoken about that both the codependent and the narcissist both experience attachment trauma, and we both agree the, defense, the early defense structure or defense mechanisms um, that help them survive this traumatic environment um, ultimately set up the relationship template that created their respective disorders then we agree completely. The codependent and the narcissist are the same with regards to being um, subjected to an, um, attachment trauma or trauma, um, and they are one of the same. Um, where, um, and I'm not even sure if we disagree. We just are running out of time to talk about this. Is that um, that um, what makes them different? Is that the the narcissist is so much more deeply damaged that. Um, their psychological processes uh, require them to shut down and think only about their own needs. And the codependents, because they were able to get some love, albeit um, uh, conditional love, um, weren't as damaged as much. So yes, mm -hmm. I think, I think um, we're on the same page where we say they are the same with regard to the trauma that they carry. They just... Exactly. Uh, but, exactly. That's the coin. That's the set coin that I mentioned. Flip sides of the same set tragic coin. That's the coin. Exactly. And I finally agree with you because I've been I've been wanting to tell you I disagree with you. So this is this is. Feel <laughs> free. Feel free. You don't need my permission. You remember. <laughs> hey, let's take a second to tell uh, to tell our folks that um, you and I are uh, and I, I've never been more excited about a training. But we're giving a, um, a Sam and I are giving a um, a training. Uh, on uh, November 28th, Saturday in London. Sam, do you recall the title of the training? It, the, the title is The Two Faces of Dysfunctional Love, Understanding Narcissism and, and Codependency. And not only are we both going to give trainings in our respective fields, but I understood from you that we're going to have a pan panel discussion. Yes, um, the, the, the way that it's set up is we're going to um, uh, speak on our respective um, areas of expertise. 
You'll talk more about co uh, narcissism, and I'll talk more about codependency, and then um, and for two and a half hours. And then we're going to have, in total, an hour and a half panel discussion in which we both um, uh, share our point of views and answer questions. So if anyone is interested in attending, um, attending this training, go to um, the website advancedclinicaltrainers.com. And I, and I say goodbye to all of you. And, uh, and, and Sam, I can't thank you enough for participating um, in this discussion and in the training. That's a pleasure. Thank you, Ross. And I hope next time we can discuss covert narcissism. It's a hot topic.